Zoom screen is available in both English and French. Um, at the top of the Zoom window, you should see View Options. And if you click on uh, View Options, a drop down menu should appear. Uh, and if you go to Shared Screens, you'll see two names. Uh, Neha is sharing the English slide deck, and Shanali is sharing the French version. So uh, please click um, either name for the language that you prefer. Uh, in addition, please note that this session will be recorded and shared later. So uh, access uh, will be available for anyone unable uh, to attend today's session. Uh, with that, we can begin. Uh, for today's session, I will quickly go over some background information on the development of the guidance document that has recently been shared. Um, before handing over to other colleagues, we'll present the methodology underpinning this guidance. Um, we've also left a lot of time uh, for Q&A, where we hope to hear from country colleagues, both on the guidance um, and on upcoming work that would benefit from using it. Uh, next slide, please. And the following one, thank you. Uh, so under this program, we're looking to have broad private sector engagement across uh, different private sector groups. Uh, and of course, recognize that the scope of engagement uh, will vary based on the group. And uh, although we're not limiting ourselves to the approaches uh, mentioned here, in general, we see opportunities for engagement with uh, large global companies, focusing more on building resilience and emission res reduction uh, within their supply chains. Uh, while the focus with SMEs and smaller producers would be more on building their capacity to apply resilient agricultural practices uh, and in creating linkages to markets uh, and um, creating access to finance for sustaining resilient investments. Uh, for, for industry associations, we, we see them as a strong way to facilitate multi-stakeholder engagement um, and to link with different individual private sector actors, um, as well as foundations, which can also be a source for uh, CSR contributions and funding. But in general, across our, all groups, uh, the underlying ambition of the, for the program is to work with the private sector in creating uh, a pipeline of, of project ideas or interventions that can, that can crowd in investment, uh, supplemented by the right kind of public de-risk and support that we hope uh, will be identified through all these activities. Um, next slide, please. So today's session is intended to support activities under the first intervention area that you see circled uh, on private sector mapping, outreach, and engagement. Uh, we will also be planning subsequent guidance uh, and different sessions that cover the other intervention areas on assessing risks, risks business opportunities, um, and uh, please uh, mute their uh, microphones. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, and uh, sorry, we will be disseminating other guidance material as a program progresses uh, on the other different intervention areas, uh, including opportunity risk and barrier analysis and also sure, developing... Sorry for the intervention, please. I, I couldn't sure. get the English version. Can you repeat how I can access the English version? Oh, of course. Okay. If, yes, please. Babu. If you look at the top of your screen, you'll see something that says you're viewing Neha Rai's, uh, FA, uh, Neha Rai's screen in green. Next to that, you'll see view options. If you click that, um, you'll see um, a menu that shows shared screens, and then you'll see Neha Rai and Shanali. So for Sh Shanali, we'll have the French uh, slides. And if you click Neha, you should be able to see the English slides. Have you, have you managed to do this or find this drop down? Okay, I'm going to assume that it's worked out, but if not, please uh, um, type in the chat box. I'm sure you could get some support. Yes, it's worked out. Great. Now it is okay. No problem. Great. Good to hear. Um, uh, next slide, please. Before getting into uh, the methodology part, uh, this slide shows in more detail where these activities fall under you know, the spectrum of private sector engagement activities um, that, we, that we see across work plans. Um, as you can see, the guidance will cover all of the, the second activity um, and, and also some of the, the third activity uh, on the right side, um, which for most work plans uh, covers activities under the first two outcomes. And uh, this really demonstrates how private sector engagement is, is across, uh, across all program outcomes. Um, 
so now with that, uh, I think uh, we can get straight into the methodology and I'll hand it over to Neha to take us through it. Neha, over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, thanks Shovan for giving that overview. Um, I think uh, before I leap into the actual explanation of the methodology, it's quite important to highlight why we decided to focus on this topic, um, primarily because um, we went through the work plans, we looked at which work plans have prioritized private sector mapping. And one of the things which was striking was that seven out of 12 countries are keen to identify private sector entities as part of their sub activities in year one itself. And um, private sector mapping is a core activity, not only uh, in outcome one, but also in different elements of uh, outcome one and two, which includes, um, if you look at this map, commodities in the cattle corridor of Uganda, where private sector mapping will be a part of the system assessment, sugarcane value chain of Thailand, where there would be a value chain analysis and private sector mapping would be a part of that. Um, the millet and groundnut value chain of Senegal, uh, where there would be a preliminary mapping plus a value chain analysis. And then the livestock sector of Ethiopia and forest uh, risk commodities in Cambodia. And I have my colleague Vivian here who will take you through this one of the examples later on. But uh, just to contextualize the purpose of having this session was to go through uh, some of the components which countries are uh, leaping into right now. So um, I'll take you through the approach. Uh, we've shared the guidance with you beforehand, but the approach here uh, is, is a summarized version of the guidance uh, so that we can explain what are the bits and pieces that can be undertaken. And there will be moments to clarify this on a one-on-one -on -one basis later on. Uh, but this particular session is just go through the main elements of the approach. So. Um, as already mentioned here in the slide, um, this is a three-pronged -prong approach, uh, which has these three main steps. Uh, this guidance, it builds on a wide range of methodologies that exist. And one of the things uh, that we have got inspired from is um, the effective collaboration methodology, which you already heard of in the uh, food and agriculture commodities uh, webinar earlier uh, last month. Uh, so this builds on that uh, webinar as well as the methodology. Um, another element to focus on is that private sector mapping um, a, oftentimes implies just creating a long list of private sector actors. In this guidance, uh, we beyond, go beyond just creating a comprehensive list. The focus is to help country teams prioritize actors and develop engagement methods and ensure a bit of transparency in who is engaged so that we are not cherry picking actors. Um, so the approach is not only applicable to Scala projects, but also to GCF and GEF projects where there is private sector engagement, uh, ensuring that we involve the right people in the room. So the first step is to identify the private sector landscape. What is the system or a commodity value chain and map the actors within them. And the second step, uh, which is quite crucial, is to prioritize and segment the prospective partners, which includes developing a profile of the private sector companies, analyzing them based on their relevance in terms of climate uh, change, and prioritizing them based on their contribution potential. And the third and final step is to develop engagement plans, uh, which includes uh, identifying the most appropriate uh, methodology for engagement or modality for engagement. Um, so I'll deep dive into those three main steps and explain this a bit more. So the first step, uh, as I mentioned, is the most simplistic one on mapping and creating this comprehensive list of private sector actors. And based on a secondary review, project teams should be able to form an initial understanding of uh, the core processes of the value chains and the main actors involved in these processes. Now, uh, a lot of this information can be gathered through business platforms or commodity platforms to access the list of the private sector. And this ideally should 
constitute of a wide range of actors and not one or two actors. Uh, FAO and UNDP both have the definitions of private sector and that includes um, farmers and farmers organization, as you can see on the left-hand side, producers organizations, cooperatives, uh, small and medium enterprises, uh, large enterprises, financial institutions, philanthropic foundations also fall under the private sector and industry and trade association. Um, private sector actors should, as I said, should also be mapped by their role in the value chain, which is quite crucial as different actors in the value chain will be affected differently. A lot of times what we see is that the private sector list at the moment comprise a random list of actors, often input suppliers or producer companies and does not cover all actors in the value chain, which could be problematic. Uh, so processors, which are significantly affected by climate change, often gets left out in the list. And that's why I think it's quite important to have all the actors which may be impacted by climate change. As we know that processors would be impacted by floods or diseases, while production um, companies may be in fact impacted by scanty rainfall. So having that wide group of actors is quite important. So here on the right hand side, we can see the example of actors in a value chain. And the first key actor is to uh, engage the associations and the federations. And these are the information uh, leads for um, all other private sector contacts. Um, and these can be a commodity specific networks that can help uh, producers organize, negotiate contracts, and they can play a key role in organizing farmers to become more climate resilient. The second set of actors here is input suppliers, which often are quite easy list that we tend to create. Uh, and these are the companies that sell seeds, fertilizers and machinery. And these can be big companies like Bayer or Syngenta or smaller companies uh, that earn profits from climate markets. Then it's uh, the producers, companies or farmers that produce yield and sell to processors or anchor companies. And then I think it's quite important to mention anchor companies or aggregator companies that purchase from farmers because these can be often traders or processors and they invest in the farm in return for assured uh, quality harvest. And they can play an important role in making producers more accountable in traceability systems. Uh, and that's why I mentioned them here. And then processors and buyers and distributors. These are companies that add value to produce. Uh, for example, if you have a millet value chain or a groundnut value chain, then the ones that will convert the produce into, into biscuits or cookies or flour or other products and sell to retailer would be uh, processors and buyers. And then traders and retailers, uh, these are global and domestic companies that trade and import. Um, and then finally, financiers, which can fund SMEs or all other companies that want to transition to low carbon resilient systems. So creating a value chain uh, map and then identifying the actors would be the first step. And uh, an output of this particular particular step would be that a private sector stakeholder register is created with a list of stakeholder based on roles within their value chain. Now, the second step is uh, after we have created that list is uh, to prioritize the private sector actors. And in this methodology, we uh, try to um, bring in a scoring process to help that. This will help in maximizing uh, private sector efficiency so that we can focus our limited uh, resources on partners that are likely to engage significantly and for a sustained period. So um, companies that are hugely affected by climate change or contributing to climate change or which have a high ability to contribute to climate action uh, our invest in climate action would score high in this process. So that's the scoring methodology um, that we have here. 
that we have uh, designed. So uh, just to give you some of the criteria here, companies that score high on climate relevance will be those that are vulnerable to climate risk or contribute to climate change or are uh, potential beneficiaries in carbon uh, and climate markets. Companies with gender focus or past engagement in sustainability initiatives would also fall under high climate relevance criteria. Um, companies that can be scored high for the contribution potential are those that are able to enable climate action due to uh, the investment potential or they have a policy for climate action or zero deforestation, uh, net zero, et cetera. So having uh, this analysis is quite crucial in this step to make sure we are able to identify uh, what types of uh, actors these are and how we can engage them. Now, this graph shows if uh, companies have high climate relevance and high climate uh, contribution potential, then they can be champions or they can be engaged as someone who can contribute towards the SCALA program and all other climate actions that uh, the country teams are proposing. For example, these can be global or national companies or producer associations that are impacted by climate change on the right-hand side, the champions, uh, and have clear sustainability programs to support climate action. And these are the actors who probably are already engaged in NDC NAPs or in sustainability programs or development programs. So having those actors on board in uh, co-creating is quite um, important. In this graph, you also see actors who are contributors, and these are companies that may score high in contribution potential, but not directly affected by climate change. For example, uh, investment funds, national development banks mandated to support agribusinesses uh, through targeted lending. They are um, quite instrumental in providing the finance, but may not see the direct linkage with climate change at this moment, but of course they are affected, uh, but they are um, potentially contributors to the program. And then there are companies uh, that are affected by climate risks, but have very low investment potential. Uh, they struggle to shift to climate smart practices because of cost reasons, these are usually small and medium enterprises and they are neutral companies. So a wide range of MSMEs that struggle to transition to climate smart practices would fall under the neutral category. Um, so having a good understanding of these type of actors and where they can contribute and what is their relevance is quite important to design an engagement strategy. To make that happen, I think, we have in our methodology, we give a bit of detail on how you can analyze this information, but we suggest three different approaches to uh, understand how the climate relevance and the contribution potential of uh, private sector. It could be a light touch approach when the resources are less, where in addition to secondary review, you discuss with a few set of associations to understand what type of climate risks different actors are exposed to, what climate change measures are in place, and use the ex existing climate analysis on actors in the value chain to, to unpack uh, the, the climate relevance and the contribution potential, and then validate through a workshop. A medium effort approach would mean organizing a business survey or more detailed in-depth interviews, plus a scenario analysis, and focus group discussions through a multi-stakeholder dialogue to discuss how the businesses are affected by climate change and how they are planning to invest in climate change. The third main way of going about this uh, analyzing and segmenting uh, private sector actors would be to conduct a full value chain analysis study. And we have the value chain uh, methodology for that and some countries will be using that more in the outcome three. Uh, and we will have a session for that on, 
in in October um, after the summer break. And that would include a more detailed analysis of private sector actors. Um, so, so in the end, uh, an output of this whole second step would be a scoring of private acts, uh, sector actors with most relevance for partnering on Scala activities. The next thing which I want to mention is, um, you know, it's not only about uh, mapping and analyzing, but we have to develop engagement plans with the private sector actors, and then also seek a bit of approval and expression of interest from them where they see value propositions of engaging in the Scala. So um, we will uh, you know, unpack suitable types of engagement based on their relevance and importance and design engagement methods uh, going further. So country teams can adopt different levels of engagement uh, depending on uh, the analysis was, which was done in under step two. Um, so at the end of step two, we would have uh, some understanding of who are the companies which should be consulted only, which is an informal mechanism of engagement. For example, a neutral companies which are interested in engaging in climate action, but experience uh, several challenges because of financial reasons to shift to climate smart practices may only be interested in um, training programs or uh, in uh, getting consulted on uh, what are the barriers they're being exposed to. So they will be more interested in getting informal engagement um, going further. And identifying that early on is quite important so that we don't raise expectations. Whereas uh, companies which are champions, which are already investing or which are already uh, trying to do something in the climate sphere, uh, they can provide support in terms of knowledge, in kind uh, guidance, uh, technical support, or access to their member networks, uh, and they can co-create investment projects. And they should be involved in more formal partnerships. Uh, and these are can be aggregated companies that can be engaged in supplier agreements or uh, minimum prize and practice certification input suppliers that can deliver climate action like climate re resilient seeds or financiers who can contribute in co-financing GCF, GEF projects or bankable investments. Um, so having the idea of who will be interested in what will be quite important for developing these engagement plans that can be tailored for specific uh, actors, and then we can seek expression of interest from them. In the end, uh, the output of this practice would be that we have um, specific entry points, tailored engagement plans, um, a validation workshop to confirm those plans, and an expression of interest from relevant private sector actors going further. Uh, one last thing I wanted to mention before I end and before my colleague Lapo goes through a practical example of Excel tool is um, that while we are trying to do uh, all these um, analysis and also start thinking of engagement with the private sector, it's quite important to um, already start thinking about due diligence and how we really manage risks. Um, both FAO and UNDP have a fit for purpose uh, due diligence process. Um, so before formal partnerships with private sector actors are established, we need to identify what are these guidelines. So informal en engagements like informing, consulting, connecting, trainings, interaction companies where there is no actual financial commitment or any other commitment does not require a formal assessment, but any other um, activity which requires more formal partnerships where there is financial transaction consult, uh, we need to have a more due diligence process or a risk management approach uh, that needs to be embedded it by the country already right now. So in the guidance, we mentioned what these are and you can have a look at it. But when you're having more um, 
informal multi-stakeholder engagements, uh, consultations, you don't need all that at this stage. Um, but I think it's worth mentioning that here. This is the Excel tool, which uh, I wanted to highlight, which um, LAPU will take you through um, at, in, in a bit more detail. Uh, but I'll, I'll stop there. The other thing which I um, wanted to mention is that re with regards to this whole work of private sector, it's the four of us, uh, Farah, Shovan, Lapo, and, and Neha, which is me, uh, we are supporting the private sector team on different components of the work. So um, in case you want to consult on the guidance or anything, please get in touch with us. But I'll, I'll stop there and let's hear from LAPO on the examples. And after that, uh, show one will take us through um, some of the other examples of application of this methodology already happening uh, through Senegal and uh, Uganda. Thank you. Thank you, Neha, and good morning, afternoon, and uh, evening to everyone. So as Neha said, I would like to quickly guide you through this uh, Excel template tool we developed to facilitate the, the practical um, application of these guidelines. I think you should see my screen right now. Tell me if it's not the case, but yeah, I think I'm sharing at the moment. So uh, the output of this exercise is very simple and consists in uh, um, creating a, a register of contacts and scoring system according to the methodology that uh, Neha just shared with uh, all of us. So for the sake of this uh, presentation, we took some example of private sector actors involved in the millet value chain of uh, Senegal, just to give a concrete example of how the tool would look like once it is uh, uh, filled. So as you can see on my screen, the first part of the Excel file is simply aimed at noting down uh, contact details of uh, each stakeholder. I think you see my uh, arrow on the screen. Um, and um, please know that, of course, it may not be necessary to have specific contact point in each private sector actor analyzed, but just filling the first line with the name of the company, in case this is accessible, would be absolutely fine, of course. Um, then here in the um, in the green uh, in the green in the green cells that you can uh, find here with a climate profile. So starting from column uh, I, actually, uh, the actual exercise of scoring starts, and the user has the option of uh, uh, providing some general comments on the climate profile of the uh, of the company. So first, uh, selecting from a dropdown, and I'm again on column high. Um, I'm not sure you can see the dropdown, but anyways, uh, there is uh, the option of uh, selecting uh, one um, among the, the main interests for the company to be concerned with uh, climate change. So for example, because it is affected by climate change risks, because uh, it may be one of the main contributors to climate change, or it has the potential to invest in some climate relevance uh, practices, just to name uh, a few. Um, then it, in column J, instead, there is a possibility to provide in a few words some uh, eventual um, uh, additional details, yes. Then in column in the following column, so we are here now in column K, um, there is a possibility to attribute a, a score from 1 to 10 to determine the climate relevance of the company. That is, as Neho mentioned before, the extent to which the company is affected by climate change and to which extent the company is already putting in place strategies to mitigate or uh, adapt to the effects of uh, climate change. So for example, yeah, a, a bank may not be directly affected by climate change and may not be a direct contributor to climate change, but may have a lot of mechanisms which is already engaging in policy processes, uh, for instance, by collaborating with uh, institutions. So the other important thing for these uh, columns is that the score is, uh, of course, uh, subjective. And uh, um, yeah, the coherence of this course is, of course, up to the person that is uh, filling this, uh, this registry. Um, then, and uh, let's move now to the column starting with a uh, column uh, N. So these columns in, uh, in red. Um, these columns are aimed at attributing instead the uh, climate potential of a company. That is the possibility for the private actor to contribute to climate action through investments, for example, uh, corporate environmental programs, or the presence and visibility on market of these companies or private actors. And in this case, uh, as again, Nia was mentioning before, it's rather larger companies that would be expected to score higher, as in this category, 
it's uh, easier that if a company is larger, it has also a larger potential of investment and uh, also larger geographical coverage if uh, a sustainability policy is uh, adopted by that actor. So um, going now on column uh, P, so uh, here it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's more um, about pointing out uh, which commodities or value chains the companies uh, are focused on. And then in the following uh, columns, here we are still in the second step of the guidance that was uh, illustrated below. Um, there is an automatic calculation of the scores, basically a sum of the scores that were attributed in the, in the, in the previous columns. And based on the score obtained, uh, you can see instructions uh, over there um, to determine if the company has a high or low climate relevance and tension. These are the columns S and U. Um, finally, uh, and based on the scores uh, obtained in each of these uh, categories, you can determine if the company is a champion, a contributor, uh, a neutral company or private sector actor, or not really interested in engaging, uh, according to the criteria that Neha mentioned be before. So we have headed some um, short indications on what we mean with these terms in the top of each column that you can see uh, that you can see here. Um, but we provide also more details, both on the guidance document, the, the PDF we, we shared with you, and also in the definition sheet, which is a sheet below this Excel file where you can find more uh, comprehensive definitions. So now looking at the first uh, examples that we have here, so I would like now to, um, I would like you to focus on uh, row five. Um, we have uh, a, the case of an association of producers of millet. So it's an association gathering uh, many uh, local producers. And this type of actor can of course be considered as significantly affected by climate change, having then high climate relevance. Um, however, they have a low contribution potential, as the association usually represents small producers with uh, limited financial means. And this makes the Millet Producer Association an actor that needs to be involved, for example, through, you can see it at the end of uh, this uh, exercise, uh, through consultations, interviews, or dialogues, for example, uh, to understand the needs of producers, as well as to channel the support where it's uh, needed the most. Now passing to the second example, which is instead the case of a processor, another type of actor that uh, Neha described among the set that we would like to, uh, to map during these exercises. Um, we are talking about a buyer and processor that buys uh, millet, so yeah, agricultural commodities, and then makes a, a yogurt based on millet. In this case, uh, similarly to the millet producer, uh, the actor can be significantly affected by climate change. However, being a small sized uh, business with limited understanding and um, capacity to uh, plan ahead on the future effects of climate change, we are again in the case of a neutral actor, not capable to contribute actively, but in the position to benefit from capacity building and training activities, for example, on the development of climate uh, resilient practices. Now, moving to the seventh row, Instead, we have a, a very different actor, and it's the case of an agricultural bank scoring low in terms of uh, climate relevance because a bank or a financial institution is not directly affected by climate change, but with a high contribution potential because, of course, financial institutions can mobilize uh, uh, many resources also on the relative uh, large scale, national or even international, and has a high geographical coverage as well. So it matches the definition of a, a contributor and uh, because it's in the position to collaborate and create a potential joint project, uh, projects with, um, in collaboration with Scala, at least in uh, potential. Finally, to give one last uh, example, which is again slightly different, uh, it's the case of uh, the foundation of the agricultural input company uh, Syngenta. So this company is uh, different from others because being part of a large multinational companies, it has a yes, high contribution potential through the mobilization of funds, but it has uh, also high ambitions to engage in sustainability actions and also consistently contributes to climate change. So this makes a very high scores in uh, a very high score in terms of uh, um, uh, contribute uh, of climate relevance. Sorry. Um, However, yes, this uh, contribution in terms of um, uh, this potential contribution in terms of um, um, 
uh, in terms of uh, engagement uh, that this company may have uh, allows it to score very high also in terms of climate uh, uh, of both climate relevance and uh, climate potential. This means that companies uh, such as yeah, the foundations or just the sustainability departments of larger uh, international companies can be defined uh, champions because they are scoring high in both these two categories. So this is briefly what we wanted to share with you at this stage. And of course, you have to keep in mind that this approach can be adapted very easily to the local needs context, also in terms of uh, uh, scoring system. If you have any suggestion to propose, uh, the document is, of course, open to any kind of uh, review. But we hope that this will facilitate a bit the practical declination of the mapping approaches in the countries that will uh, integrate uh, this type of uh, exercise in their, uh, in their activities under the SCALA program. So uh, my presentation is over. And let me pass the word back to Siobhan before opening the floor for any kind of questions. Thank you, Lapo, and thank you, Neha, for this uh, really comprehensive and uh, informative theoretical and practical walkthrough. Um, without further ado, we can open up the floor for Q&A, and uh, I, I encourage uh, country, country colleagues to, to share some of the experiences that they're currently having with, uh, with this kind of mapping and engagement if they've already begun these activities, and also, of course, any questions based on uh, the presentation. So. Um, and just to quickly answer a, a question from Berhanu, yes, after this session, we will be sharing the presentation. Um, we'll also be sharing a recording of this session. Um, so yeah, the floor is open. Um, happy to take any questions or hear any comments from, from uh, country office colleagues, backstoppers, anyone else who wants to come in. Alternatively, you could also um, type in your questions in the chat box if you prefer. Hi, Shivan. I, I just had a bit, one question. Can I come in? Of course. Thank you, Gloria. Okay. Please go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, actually, um, I'm just looking at this tool that has been presented as one of the tools we can use with our private sector actors. I'll give an example in the case of Uganda. Uh, we work with the private sector foundation, which is the umbrella organization for the private sector. And we've also been uh, supporting them to come up with specific tools to analyze their contribution towards climate action under the NDC and, and also I think companies right now, like you, you all mentioned, are looking at, you know, showing their contribution as part of CSR, but also, you know, every, um, as part of green green growth and the green transition and preparing they, they really have to contribute to climate action or environmental conservation in, in anything in that regard. So I'm looking at this tool as one that probably we could also introduce to, to our privacy characters like the the private sector foundation together that we can use to analyze um, how companies are performing. And also it's clear that many companies have not considered climate action as part of their operations, but now they are getting there. Many companies are thinking through that. Even banks have uh, seen that, you know, if they, if they work with farmers and farmers are affected, they will not get you know, the revenue. And that means the, the financial operations will be affected as well. So. I, I just want to compliment and say that this is really useful and I think it's something that we'll share across. And um, also the question I had asked prior of how it works with the different levels of companies. I think it's also very important that it can be applicable for all uh, companies, like you said, but I was just also thinking through there are some very small scale companies that uh, for process in the value chains that potentially would not foresee their bigger contribution, but how this can be applicable, I think would be on a case by case basis. So yeah, I just wanted to share those thoughts, but I think this is really very useful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gloria, for uh, those reflections. And uh, yeah, I think uh, what, you, what you said is definitely something that you know we're envisioning and hopefully will be useful across for different actors. I mean, you know, this is something that can be shared uh, I mean, it, it can be used for, you know, consultants can definitely be onboarded 
anyone who wants to use this tool should be quite straightforward and, um, and a good way to categorize different actors and see what the opportunities are. So uh, thank you for that. Um, maybe just to also get this conversation flowing uh, and not to put you on the spot, but Vivian, would you want to come in with maybe some of the experiences that you're having uh, since uh, I know that we've been working closely together with you on, on some of these different activities as a backstopper? Thanks. Yes, uh, definitely. Thank you. So I want to thank the private sector team for uh, taking us through all these steps and also for supporting us um, throughout the process. So I wanted to share our experience um, for, of applying actually this guide, this private sector uh, uh, plan, uh, mapping uh, strategy in Senegal, which we just started. So um, just uh, so we follow, we are following these steps, but I wanted to share like uh, maybe the previous steps that we are we are taking that are informing the whole process. So first of all, what we are doing in Senegal. So they say that we are focusing on millet, groundnut, and market gardening. And um, so the first step that we did is to identify the big federation of the private sector. And um, uh, we conducted uh, exploratory consultations and uh, interviews with them um, to understand their role in the value chain, their climate profile, their interest needs, access to, and also most importantly, to have access to the network because they are a group of big federations that have a group of different actors uh, uh, in, in those uh, value chains. So um, one of the tips I will give here, or one of our experience I'll say here is while we are doing the interviews, because we contacted like, um, let's say we visited um, like uh, seven federations. And one of the tips I'll give here is while we are doing these interviews to kind of uh, uh, have uh, different categories. For example, in Senegal, we visited the, the, we did interviews with the Bank Agricole, which um, is a funding uh, financial institution that group many uh, organization of farmers at different level across the value chain. And also um, an association that called uh, Federation Nationale pour l'Agriculture Biologique. And this is more of a research. So it's kind of another angle of a research institution that group different, uh, group uh, 44 um, farmers organizations and uh, it has 50,000 members. So this was as well a good entry point. And then uh, another level of uh, interviews was one of the associations that is a member of, 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 the, of the Federation Nationale de Biologique. And this was the Association Union de Maraîchères. So that is like now one of the farmers association, which also have different small associations. So the whole, um, uh, the whole uh, 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 insight from, from these different categories kind of gave us, um, made it possible to build a database of uh, 50 uh, private sector association along the value chain, which will form now a basis uh, for the uh, complete value chain and, uh, and private sector categorization and engagement. So. Yeah, this is one of the things we were able to do. And also this helped us to identify um, the main challenges because I mean, this organization kind of group, kind of have an information about all, all the, the, the small association and organization within. So we were able to identify the main challenges, the main need, for example, in Senegal, um, we know that uh, uh, the capacity building for the private sector will be one of the key things to focus on, to adapt existing technologies, to fund mobilization for the small scale farmers. So we were able to have these big um, areas of uh, where we are going to focus. Yeah, and also it was an opportunity to identify different partners along the way among the federations that we, we did interview with. We could also have like ideas of who could be the, um, uh, the service providers when it comes to capacity building. So yeah, that, that's all for Senegal. Um, uh, so we are at the preliminary stage, but um, I, I think it was useful to have this kind of a preliminary interviews to guide the whole process, to go through the, the process that they had uh, highlighted. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Vivian. Thanks so much uh, for, for your insights. I think those are really great points. And uh, yeah, a couple of things that I, I want to pick up on uh, from that are, 
you know, in terms of the different activities, I mean, you mentioned a couple of interesting things through this entire mapping exercise. It actually seems like a lot of the subsequent private sector work in terms of identifying partners for subsequent interventions, in terms of already doing a kind of preliminary um, analysis on different risks and opportunities, a lot of that can actually be done through this uh, initial mapping stage, through some in consultations, the initial engagement. Um, so one thing I want to point out was uh, it's not it's not just a silo. A lot of the work that is involved in this in this guidance, some of the activities can actually really contribute and kickstart some of the later activities uh, before those more detailed processes start. Uh, in terms of very robust, uh, say for instance, a value chain analysis or a very robust study into or look into uh, different uh, partners um, that can that can uh, be part of a future intervention. So really, uh, thanks for those insights. Um, Maybe I can now ask uh, Sam, Sam or Crystal to, to speak a bit about Uganda and how they're using uh, the mapping as part of a system assessment. So over to uh, maybe Samuel or Crystal. I don't know who wants to, to share, share their insights on this. Sorry, I'm not sure if we have Sam here. Okay, appears that we don't actually. Um, I don't know if Crystal, you'd want to come in, but uh, if not, we can open the floor to, to anyone else who has uh, some comments, some insights, even some questions, if, if this is part of a future activity. Okay, I think we have a question here in the chat. I'm happy to come in. Okay, great, thanks Crystal, please go ahead. Even though I do see that uh, Gloria is on the call, so I'd even welcome her to, to supplement. Um, so in Uganda, we've, as part of the system assessment, um, we have integrated, or we hope to build on the private sector guidance that um, you and Nehan Lapo have presented, um, particularly within the context of Uganda's cattle corridor. So looking at um, livestock value chains and, and various mixed um, farming systems. So we've identified five or so different uh, mixed farming systems and livelihood groups within the cattle corridor because it is such a broad, um, vast landscape, right? Um, and so building on some of the work under the climate promise and the private sector mapping that has been done um, for, for NDC implementation and their investment strategy, we hope to kind of hone in on, you know, work, building on the work that's been done at this high level kind of in DC um, strategic level and looking at within the cattle corridor and what, what are the private sector opportunities and also risks, right? Um, within each of these five um, farming systems. So the idea is to build better data, um, better risk analysis and look at opportunities for, for which private sector actors are, both, are, are best fit, right? Um, to engage with and, and how. Um, but if Gloria is on the call, um, please do come in and, and supplement that further. Yeah, thank you, Crystal. Uh, uh, in addition to that, as Chris has mentioned, we've under the ND support program, we've done um, an assessment of the contribution of the private sector towards climate action or overall implementation of the NDC targets and we identified opportunities in each of the sectors, say from agriculture, forestry, energy, waste. And then of course we identified those, those opportunities for investment for the private sector. And thereafter we've also been able to do the business case because most of the time, the private sector don't for us in this opportunity. So we did what, what's the business case for them in terms of investment, uh, in terms of the markets, in terms of the returns. So we did that. And um, and also what we did uh, is is to engage them in, into trainings on, on financial literacy, on uh, climate change, because of course, most of the private sector to some, of course, they've heard of climate action, but they are not really knowing that, for instance, if I invest in a solar powered irrigation system for a farmer, in the long run, it contributes to climate action or resilience. So we tried to you know, give them an overall package on, on what their contribution is and why it is important. And this is what we are also 
doing under the Scala project and the climate promise really to go into details of those uh, five uh, uh, districts to look at what are the opportunities across the value chains for the private sector to invest and how what contribution they can make and what are those uh, strategies that can be put forward to ensure that they invest in climate resilience or adaptation um, or contribute to mitigation and overall contribute towards the NDC targets for the country. Yeah, so this is something that we are really working on right now and also focusing on the support that has been provided previously under the NDC support program. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal, and thanks a lot, Gloria, for those additional insights. Um, yeah, just to reflect on that very quickly, I think uh, it's important to, after these initial conversations to identify and to speak to the private sector and ask them, well, once this kind of opportunity, preliminary opportunity risk um, uh, mapping is done and once these, once these uh, consultations have happened, uh, I think it's a really important next step that, that we would encourage is to is design a proper study, whether it's a market assessment, a value chain assessment, but basically understand from the private sector um, what are the kind of informational gaps, what are the different barriers, and how to really get, you know, develop a very robust analysis. And for that, we do have all these tools available. Um, one that we've been highlighting in particular is the value chain uh, toolkit that, that, that was recently developed, and we'll have a subsequent session on that. But just want to flag that this initial step is, is, is a good stepping stone uh, for understanding uh, what the next kind of analytical steps need to be to, to arrive at, uh, at proper de-risking strategies at the end of this and uh, develop concept notes. Um, with that, maybe I'll hand it over to Neha to answer some of the questions in, uh, in the chat. Neha, over to you. Yeah, um, I think we have one question, which is a very important question from uh, Cambodia. Uh, Anne has posed this question on how uh, we will ensure the issue of consistency of scoring across the wide range of private sector actors and what is the best approach to ensure that. Um, just to answer to that question, uh, the scoring process, of course, is subjective uh, and it is ranging between a score of one to 10, but the consistency is ensured through uh, making sure that we have high scoring for um, criteria one versus criteria two. So um, if uh, countries are affected by, uh, sorry, companies are affected by climate change and are contributors to climate change, then their climate relevance would be high. And that's where the consistency is. Whereas uh, the other dimensions, which are the secondary criteria are additional dimensions which uh, can be scored upon. So we will be happy to actually have a session or explain the scoring process in more detail later on. But um, the idea is that there are primary criteria and the secondary criteria. Primary criteria helps in establishing a high score. Secondary criteria is additional criteria. And um, that is the mechanism to ensure consistency. But of course, it is still subjective scoring process, um, but I'll stop there. Thanks for your answer, Neha. And uh, I noticed that another question came in from Berhanu about farmers cooperatives and community-based organizations um, that take part in input provisions. And uh, to answer that question, yes, they, they should be considered as stakeholders during the mapping process. But this, this brings a, a, another question up, I mean, I think in my head and, and, and questions that, that have come before in terms of how granular do we wanna be when we come to mapping these stakeholders. Um, and given time and resource constraints, it's probably not feasible or possible to, to really map every single community-based organization. Um, it probably makes sense to focus on some of the larger, um, more influential ones, or at the very least, um, pick ones and use those as um, sample organizations uh, in, instead of having to map all of them. So while they are certainly a stakeholder group that should be mapped and, and should be consulted, as you know, they're extremely, I mean, a, a huge part of this entire process is, is making sure that the, the resilience is, uh, of these uh, stakeholders are boosted. I don't think it's necessary to, or, or usually feasible, uh, to really go around mapping all of these organizations if, if the number is too high. Um, so I hope that that also answers your question, Berhani. And I don't think we have any other questions in the chat. So um, 
yeah, I think now's a good time. If anyone has any other, if anyone wants to um, come in in the chat or, or otherwise with any comments or questions, please go ahead. I'll give it a few seconds to, to check and see if there are any hands. Okay, doesn't look like uh, there are too many more questions or any other questions in the chat box either. So since we only have three minutes, uh, maybe a good time to, to wrap up. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for, for joining the session. Uh, we hope it's been um, informative. Uh, and I just want to highlight a few things uh, before we wrap up. Uh, first of all, this session, the guidance will be disseminated again. Uh, I think we've had a draft version that's been sent. Um, and we will also be sharing this uh, this video recording. In addition, please uh, you know feel free to to contact anyone on the global private sector team. We'd be more than happy to um, organize and, and participate in one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations in terms of how to use this mapping, um, different phase, parts of the mapping, um, and I think in particular uh, we would be more than happy to provide su support during the engagement planning phase, where I think it's a uh, actually quite important to, to, to look at what the Scala's value proposition is and to position Scala in a way that will attract private sector for, uh, you know, private sector for uh, their participation in the program and really demonstrate what value um, Scala could add if they do participate. Um, and uh, overall, I know we've been having uh, country office consultations with a lot of you who, are, who have attended this session and um, we look forward to engaging with you further on this and then other sector activities down the line. Uh, so with that, we'll wrap up the session. Thanks again for joining and look forward to working with everyone uh, moving forward. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.